Last night, it was a thrilling sight to see scores of young people march down these aisles to surrender themselves to full-time Christian service. These young people had been presented with a hard and severe challenge. They had been told that to follow Christ may mean privation, suffering, and even death. In spite of the hard terms of the invitation, more than 400 responded to follow Christ in full-time Christian service. The challenge that Christ offers is not easy. In Luke 9, 23, Christ said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Again, Jesus said, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my follower. Again, Christ said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Paul had said, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but refuse, that I may win Christ. Jesus Christ said, The foxes have holes, and the birds have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. In other words, Christ said, If you're going to follow me, you may suffer privation, poverty, hardship, suffering, sacrifice, and eventually death. But he promised that the rewards would be immeasurable. Ladies and gentlemen, there are on foreign soil today thousands of valiant missionaries of the cross of Jesus Christ. Hundreds of these missionaries have suffered all of these things during the past few years for the name of Christ. Yet they carry on heroically many times forgotten by the people at home. I'm thoroughly convinced that the message that these Christian missionaries carry to the foreign field is the answer to the international program of communism. To thousands of American tourists visiting Europe this summer, it is becoming more and more obvious that American foreign policy is not winning friends even among our oldest allies. There are many reasons for this. Some are obvious and some are not so easy to find. However, There is a general agreement among reporters and authorities on what others are thinking of us. Recent United Nations reports show that more than 50% of the English called the Americans conceited. Nearly 50% of the French think we're domineering. Only one in three Frenchmen considered the United States generous, despite the fact that we have poured nearly three billions of dollars into France since World War II. It is also easy for American tourists traveling in Europe this summer to find out what foreign opinion is of our morals. Despite the fact that the United States looks upon religion more favorably than any power in the world, the rest of the world considers our religion to be little more than window dressing to cover up a basic immorality. They believe us to be immoral because of the types of films and literature we ship to their shores. They believe us to be immoral because of the loose standards displayed by many American tourists who find that a trip away from our shores is a chance for a fling. Another reason we're disliked is the attitude of superiority in luxurious living shown by our people. Who are driving the biggest automobiles in France? Americans. Who eats the best food in France or England or Japan? Americans. The Americans seem to be flaunting themselves before the poor of the world, and the poor of the world hate us for it. Almost too late, our government is beginning to recognize our mistake and is trying desperately to correct it. The foreign peoples also dislike us because we're pouring money into their countries. No creditor was ever loved in a materialistic sense, for the creditor must restrict the debtor to protect his investment. Much of the world is looking at us as a Simon Legree, or as one ready to exact our pound of flesh. Someone has recently said that one care package to a family in Europe does more to win that family than all the Marshall Plan. Leading magazines across the country have been asking and trying to answer the question, why does the world hate Americans? The answers have been many and varied. There are materialistic reasons, there are moral reasons, there are psychological reasons. Americans have become the policemen of the Western world. We've taken the place of the British. A generation ago, it was the British that were hated. Today, it is the Americans. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not all dark. There is one bright spot on the horizon which suggests to us a solution. That solution is the message of Jesus Christ which is being carried by hundreds of American missionaries. Few Americans realize the magnificent job being done by gospel missionaries on the foreign field. Seldom is there a man who travels abroad and really gets to the people, but that he recognizes the work of these Christian representatives. Wendell Wilkie, after his defeat for the presidency in 1940, toured Asia. 
And when he returned, he told the whole world what the missionaries had done to present the best side of the United States to others. After a tour of Africa some months ago, the great Christian industrialist, Mr. R.G. Letourneau, became concerned about American relations in Africa. He also felt a burden for the souls of millions of illiterate people on the dark continent. God gave him the novel idea of equipping a large boat with all types of modern machinery and sending technical missionaries to Liberia to not only give the people the message of the gospel of Christ, but to teach them agriculture, industry, and to give them an education. With regeneration in one hand and a cup of cold water in the other, Mr. Letourneau's boat is now in Africa, and the entire Christian world is watching this new and unique experiment in Christian missions. These missionaries of the cross in foreign countries are the best American ambassadors we could send out. They are sent without one cent of cost to the American treasury in Washington. These missionaries are not highly paid. They are little known and often forgotten. They've gone for but one purpose, and that is to present the message of Jesus Christ to the millions who have never heard his name. Nevertheless, unconsciously, they become representatives of the United States government and have done more for public relations than any single group we have ever sent from American shores. One high state official in Washington told me some months ago it would pay the American government to invest millions in Christian missions because Christian missions do more to bring about good feelings on the part of foreigners toward America than any other single thing. These missionaries preach Christ. They translate the Bible portions into languages they can understand. They teach the people to read. They lift the natives from ignorance and uh, spiritually and mentally. Schools teach the natives the Bible and how to establish the church in their own land under their own direction and support. The people see democracy in action as the missionary slowly divests himself of authority and leaves the native pastors in charge of what they call the indigenous church. The missionary teaches the native how to build churches and improve their own properties. The missionary provides medical services, though few in number and meagerly financed. The modern missionary is the best American, the most efficient, and the most friendly of all the so-called diplomats. Dr. Edgar DeWitt Jones tells of a conversation he had with President Roosevelt before his death. He quotes Mr. Roosevelt as saying, quote, Since becoming president, I've come to know that the finest type of Americans we have abroad are the missionaries of the cross. I'm humiliated that I'm just finding out at this late date the worth of foreign missions and the nobility of the missionaries. Their testimony in China, for instance, during the war, there is no, is beyond praise. Their courage is thrilling and their fortitude heroic, end quote. Ladies and gentlemen, if the United States State Department had listened to the American missionaries in China who had spent years there and knew the foreign situation better than many of our career diplomats, we would never be in the difficulty that we're in in the Far East today. Despite the great contribution that American missionaries are making in the realm of American public relations, it is not the first purpose of the missionary to represent his country. It is his first purpose to represent Christ. But by representing Christ, he becomes the best missionary of his country. And the message that the missionary carries to the foreign shore is a threefold message. First, it is a message of personal salvation. Because in many religions of the world and the superstitions of the world, they feel that they must discover God. We're hearing a great deal today about rediscovering God. Ladies and gentlemen, you might as well go out and try to discover the sun on a clear day as to try to discover God. Because man cannot find God by seeking him because God is evident and God is seeking man. There is a verse of scripture that says, A shepherd seeketh out his flock. Francis Thompson wrote a book some time ago, some years ago, entitled The Hound of Heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, God is seeking man today. It was God that was seeking Adam when God said, Where art thou? God sought Jacob and wrestled with him all night. God sought Samuel in the silent watches of the night. God sought David up in the lonely hills. God sought Paul on the road to Damascus. And God is seeking you today. And all you have to do is open your heart and let Christ in, and God comes into your soul through Christ. Men today, however, are fleeing God. Man flees God, first of all, because he's sinful. Secondly, man flees God because he's afraid. Adam said, I am afraid. And thirdly, he flees God because he is foolish. Man thinks somehow that he can hide from God. 
There are hundreds of people sitting before me this afternoon, hundreds of listening to this radio broadcast that feel that they can hide from God. The Bible says even though you make your bed in hell, you cannot hide from God. There is no hiding from him that sits on the throne. You may think that you can go on through life neglecting God. You may think that you can hide from the Spirit of God. But the Bible says if God doesn't find you here and you set your relations right with God through accepting Christ as Lord and Savior, that he will find you out at the judgment. God is seeking man because man needs him. God is seeking man because God loves him. God is seeking man because God wants to save man. And then the second thing, the missionary carries a message of hope. The world today is mixed up and confused and frustrated. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ brings new hope to millions in the world. I talked to a man some time ago in Houston, Texas. He said, Mr. Graham, I've completely given up hope of saving America and saving our way of life. He said, I have no hope as I look into the future. When I had left his office and he had bowed his head and accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and his face was radiant through the tears, he said, I found new hope in accepting and trusting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And then thirdly, the missionary carries the message of peace in Jesus Christ. I am convinced that the world will never know world peace until we come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Years ago, a missionary landed on the Fiji Islands. When savage cannibals armed with murderous clubs rushed out threateningly against him, he cried out in the few words he had mastered in their language, My love to you! My love to you! This immediately disarmed the natives, won their interest and respect. In fewer than 50 years, the Fiji Islanders were brought to Christ, and they have never engaged in a war of their own since. What do you suppose would happen if Americans, Germans, Japanese, British, French, Italians, and Russians, peoples of all nationalities, filled with the love of the Savior who died for them on the cross, would stifle the propaganda of profiteers by bloodshed, obey God rather than men, and rush to each other with the yearning cry, my love to you, my love to you. We should be nearer international peace than any other conference that men can have. Ladies and gentlemen, today the answer to the problems of the world is Christ. The answer to your heart cry today is Jesus Christ. Open your heart and let him in. Let him flood your soul and bring you peace of conscience and peace of soul and peace of mind such as you've never known. Shall we pray? Our Father, we commit these moments to thee, praying that scores will say yes to him. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.